a number of trucking companies are reporting very strong first quarter earnings. In this hour, we'll be joined by Matt Fassler. He's the Chief Strategy Officer at XPO Logistics. XPO is one of those companies that is doing very well, and we'll find out why. And later, we recently went to Charlotte, North Carolina, to the CoreCentric Conference, and there we talked with Dale Tower. He's a CoreCentric executive to get us an update on the status of the supply chain. But first, our conversation with XPO's Matt Fassler. Some big news out of Greenwich, Connecticut, with XPO Logistics reporting its highest revenue ever for a quarter in its history, May 9th. The big numbers, uh, and we are joined by Matt Fassler. He's the Chief Strategy Officer of XPO Logistics. Matt, uh, what do the numbers tell us? We're looking at a net income of $488 million, uh, $4.22 a share. And if you compare that to a year ago, which was pretty impressive a year ago, you were at $118 million and a uh, dollar to a share. So uh, an increase almost fourfold here. What do you make of this? First of all, thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, taking a high level look at the quarter, we beat expectations for the quarter. We also issued strong guidance for the rest of the year ahead. We outperformed again in truck brokerage. That's been a recurring pattern for us. We're also ahead of where we expect it to be in our less than truckload business uh, in North America. And then also from a financial perspective, we continue to improve the financial profile of the company by reducing our debt, deleveraging, uh, if you will. The, the earnings per share and the income growth that you spoke about, they were quite strong. Uh, there was a benefit from the gain of the sale of our, of our intermodal business, which we completed in March. But even when you back that out, our adjusted earnings per share rose by 58% to $1.25. Our adjusted EBITDA, essentially a proxy uh, for pre-tax earnings of $321 million, was the best that we'd ever reported for a first quarter. It was substantially better than our guidance. We had guided to somewhere between $280 and $285 million. When you back out gains on sale of real estate uh, this year and last, that number rose 25%. Uh, from a year ago. That's on a 16% increase in revenue. So we saw profit grow faster uh, than we saw uh, revenue grow. And we're delighted that uh, as a result uh, of, of my colleague's strong efforts, our organic revenue growth, that's revenue growth excluding uh, the impact of foreign currency and fuel, uh, accelerated to 14% in the first quarter. That's up from 8% in the fourth quarter. And Dan, we saw improvement or acceleration in each of our major lines of business in North American transportation and European transportation, and then in North American LTL. Matt, uh, what does this say right now about the uh, state of the trucking industry, especially the sector that you're in, the LTL segment? It's highly competitive. But what, is this, what do these numbers say? Because your company and others that are in this area uh, all seem to be doing really pretty exceptionally well. First of all, I appreciate that. The environment's a good one. Our revenue is up 15%. Our yield, which is a, a measure of pricing, excluding the impact of fuel, was up a very healthy 9%. The price increases that we're getting on contract renewals were 11% in the first quarter. Uh, and our pricing remains robust. We're actually showing yields up uh, double digits uh, in April and quarter to date. Uh, our tonnage uh, was off very slightly. It was a bit better. Uh, than we had guided to. And our, our trend from the fourth quarter to the first quarter was much better than what you see from in terms of typical uh, seasonality. But our, our revenue trends, uh, if you look at revenue per day, which is a, a good measure uh, of financial performance for a trucking company, our revenue trends actually accelerated a bit in April from where they were in the, uh, uh, in the first quarter. So I think all of that is indicative of a healthy environment. LTL, uh, as you know, and as we've discussed, uh, is a terrific industry. Uh, and it, it's one that's shown uh, resilient pricing over the very long run uh, through a variety of cycles. Uh, that, enables us to, uh, that enables us to be very deliberate uh, uh, as we invest in the business. Uh, we're adding capacity uh, to that business in a very measured and targeted way in ways that can help improve our network and, and provide better service uh, to our customers. So that, uh, that very favorable financial loop uh, translating to favorable, favorable service loop is working quite well for us. Matt, a couple days ago, I was at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for an event with a number of uh, military groups in the U.S. Department of Labor, and uh, they're talking about a plan to get more separating military members 
into the trucking industry and uh, talking about providing scholarships. And I know that your company and a number of others in the uh, the LTL business in particular are, are doing what they can to try and get to this nagging problem of the driver shortage. Let's talk a little bit about that while well, we can. So first of all, uh, I'm happy that you brought up uh, our efforts and the industry's efforts to engage uh, military veterans. Uh, we actually recently received uh, the VETS indices employer status uh, for our strong record of hiring members of the military uh, community. Uh, this month is a very significant month demarking the collaboration between uh, the corporate sector and U.S. Army veterans and people who are transitioning uh, from the military uh, to other careers. It's a very, very important part of our culture uh, from our CEO uh, on down. Now, on the driver shortage, a couple of points to make. Uh, first of all, uh, we operate over 100 driver schools uh, within LTL. Uh, we often uh, source drivers uh, either from outside the company and oftentimes actually from our cross docks. Uh, those schools tend to produce uh, drivers who stay with us longer and who have terrific safety records. Uh, it's a real asset uh, for our company, terrific for our culture, terrific uh, economically and commercially as well. And we are uh, driving towards a very substantial increase in the number of graduates. Also, uh, while the labor markets have been exceptionally tight, uh, we're seeing some movement. We are seeing somewhat better traction in our efforts to attract and retain new drivers. I credit our, our human resources group with their efforts to engage prospective candidates, as well as, uh, I think, recognizing that the environment, which had been white, white hot, in terms of hiring is still exceptionally strong, but probably giving us a few more opportunities uh, to get more people uh, on board. It's been a, it's a critical element uh, of our effort to, to continue to improve network fluidity and, and uh, bring better service uh, to our customers. And, and we're absolutely moving in that direction. Clearly, uh, the thinking I would imagine is that uh, you have to grow your own driver base uh, and get those folks that may be in other operations divisions of the company, if they're interested, into the, the driver pool and uh, and make it worth their while. Uh, we do. And again, we have to be very uh, open-minded and versatile as to where we're going to find our candidates. Uh, we're not dogmatic uh, about the best source of people to work in the organization. I think we have seen that when we have someone who already works in an XPO environment, again, uh, most often on the dock. They understand the culture. They understand the LTL uh, industry. Uh, we know them, uh, and we're able to train them. Uh, that is probably pound for pound the candidate that we would seek out the most. But but th there are great candidates uh, for a career with us uh, as a driver or in other roles uh, coming from all walks of life. And, and I think as we have broadened out our, our marketing and broadened out our recruiting uh, deployed social media more effectively. It uh, paved easier roads of, of engaging us uh, and, and uh, continue to advertise and to market our driver schools. That's helped bring people uh, into the fold. Matt Fastler joining us on the Newsmaker Line from Greenwich, Connecticut. He's the Chief Strategy Officer for XPO Logistics, which, as we talked about at the top of the broadcast, had a pretty phenomenal quarter. We'll continue our conversation with Matt after these messages, Transport Topics Radio, Sirius XM Channel 146. This is Transport Topics Radio with your host, Dan Ronan. We're back on TTR. Our guest is Matt Fassler. He is the Chief Strategy Officer for XPO Logistics. And the company, as you can read at ttnews.com, had a pretty spectacular first quarter of 2022. The company uh, reporting net income of almost $500 million, $4.22 a diluted share, comparing that with $118 million or $1 to a share a year ago. The company's uh, net income also increased a substantial amount, 676% to $489 million from $63 million during the same period a year ago. So again, big numbers at XPO. Matt, uh, there are some folks in the, the country that are starting to be a little bit concerned as interest rates go up that uh, we could see some cooling off of the economy and the trucking industry in particular. What's your level of concern on that? Uh, there are definitely macro uh, crosswinds that we see. And if I were to think about uh, some of them, uh, first of all, the Federal Reserve uh, is obviously uh, been raising interest rates. 
um, uh, in response to inflation. We have pricing power, which puts us in a position to uh, maintain our margin profile, uh, even as even as costs rise. But still, obviously, we need to uh, watch uh, the Fed closely and and, and see what impact uh, their actions are having on economic activity. Uh, secondly, there's obviously uncertainty related to Russia and Ukraine. Uh, our European results were quite strong in the first quarter. We don't have any business and geographies directly affected uh, by the conflict. That's also worth watching. Uh, and then there are lockdowns in China. Uh, those have been an impediment to the free flow of freight uh, to the United States of late. There are some reports that, the, that those lockdowns are easing. Uh, this could actually contribute to uh, some tightening in the brokerage market uh, in the second half of the year. We're obviously watching all of these uh, closely. Uh, the economy will respond to the outcome of some of these situations, positive uh, or negative. Uh, but you saw our numbers, and uh, the month of April was a good month for us. Our Again, our revenue per day in LTL accelerated a bit from the growth rate that we had seen in the first quarter. We had a, a very strong uh, month uh, of broker, mar brokerage margin in April. Our volume growth remained uh, quite good. So if the uh, if the momentum of the underlying business is any indication, uh, the transportation markets are still healthy. What's your level of concern about fuel prices? Uh, the Energy Information Agency on May 9th reported that uh, diesel went up 12 and a half cents, 562 a gallon nationally. It's an all time high. And in just the last two weeks, diesel has gone up 46 cents with a big jump the previous week, and then add another 11 cents a gallon on top of it uh, this week. Uh, that's got to be something that uh, your team and uh, others in the trucking industry have to be pretty concerned about. We are very, very aware of it. Uh, it, it is, if you think about the direct financial implications for the company, uh, fuel is, for the most part, a pass-through uh, for our largest businesses. So th there's no great... Uh, financial impact associated with higher fuel place, prices. Uh, we obviously understand that this is a cost input for many of our customers and, and that it can have some impact on economic activity more broadly. I'd consider that to be indirect as relates to XPO. But obviously, uh, we, we've, we've been watching the movements in diesel and other forms of energy very closely. Uh, where, 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 where they are. We just issued an outlook uh, on May 9th, and, and the, outlook is, uh, the outlook as we see it uh, for energy and other commodities is embedded in that outlook. So in terms of a pass-through, you pass it through to whatever it costs. It ends up being picked up by your customers, and they end up uh, ultimately paying whatever you have to pay for it. Uh, it it's something like that. Bottom line, it, it's, a, it's part of the cost of transportation for our customers, and, and we work with our customers in rising fuel and environments, falling fuel environments. Obviously, it works itself into the market in terms of unit momentum, in terms of pricing, and, and, and all this stuff comes out in the wash over the course of the cycle. I want to just uh, shift gears a little bit because uh, there was also another announcement at your recent earnings call and the uh, earnings information that came out, and it concerns uh, what's going to be coming up this fall, where the company announced that uh, Drew Wilkerson, who's president of of your North American transportation operation uh, will become CEO of the planned spinoff tech-enabled brokerage services platform. Again, uh, here we go with uh, XPO taking one of its divisions, which has been successful, as was the case with the GXO, and now with the case with the tech-enabled brokerage division for that platform. What can we expect on this going forward in uh, into the fall of 2022? First of all, um, uh, Drew is going to kill it as CEO of that business. Uh, Drew is one of the highest energy, uh, smartest, uh, most humble people I've worked with. Uh, he would blush and get angry at me if he heard these comments, as I'm sure he will uh, when he listens to the segment. He would be a far better guest uh, than I. And I, I highly suggest... Let's book him then. <laughs> I suggest you book him as soon as you can. Uh, Drew really grew up in the brokerage business and came to XPO when we were little more uh, than a startup, a very dynamic startup with high aspirations, but we were a far, far smaller company. And he is one of the critical players who helped build up 
our brokerage operations uh, really hand in hand with our tech team. And I think it's due to people like him, and, and he is one of the single most important people in this effort, drove the collaboration between our people and our technology uh, that are driving the results uh, that we see today. So he is going to have oversight uh, for that business. He, he was the uh, odds-on obvious call uh, for Brad and the board to make uh, in terms of who is going to run that business. Uh, the, the spin is on target for the fourth quarter. Uh, it's a very exciting endeavor for the company. Uh, we think that the spin is going to create uh, the spin and, and uh, the associated divestiture uh, of our European business, also planned for later this year, are, is going to create two public companies, uh, one in uh, tech-enabled brokerage services, as you said, the other in North American LTL, uh, each of which is more fit for its, its core purpose. Uh, it'll be able to uh, direct capital allocation. It will be able to make decisions uh, on the people. It will be able to make strategic decisions in ways uh, that are very specific uh, to its business and to its mission, and that, that's going to be the case for each of brokerage uh, and uh, the LTL remain co, so to speak. And I, I think Drew uh, is really a maestro when it comes to the brokerage business. He has amazing command uh, of the organization, and he has a team. You know, we are a we are a young company with some real veterans in our organization, and Drew and his team have worked together for a long time. Uh, they are extremely loyal. They are extremely uh, team-oriented. It's an exceptionally upbeat organization. And, and the last thing I would add, when you think about their commercial impact, uh, their relationship with customers, with some of the uh, largest uh, customers in the world, some of the biggest shippers in the U.S., uh, are very, very strong. And, and we have really uh, grown, and those customers have entrusted us uh, with their business. And, and we have uh, exceptionally long tenure uh, with many, many of our uh, largest customers. And when you think about the fact that we've grown our volume in brokerage by over 20%, six quarters in a row, it's testament to the team that he has built and that he is leading today. It seems as though one of the core philosophies of your chairman, Brad Jacobs, is to uh, increase the businesses and uh, grow them separately. And along the way as well, in the remaining two and a half minutes we've got left, to increase overall share, shareholder value, to make uh, this more valuable for those that invest in the company, whether it be GXO or XPO or the upcoming spinoff. Uh, Brad is uh, highly focused on his fiduciary duty to drive shareholder value. He is extremely flexible on how to make that happen. Uh, he and our board have made a series of decisions over the years uh, aimed at ensuring uh, that, our, that our shareholders uh, do well. And his track record in doing that here and in his prior companies has been outstanding. Now, it just so happens uh, that the best way to do that is to innovate, provide a quality product at a fair price, uh, drive high levels of customer satisfaction, uh, and, and build upon that uh, to drive value really across the value chain. If our customers are happy, if our people are engaged, uh, working well, getting paid for it, uh, then our shareholders can thrive. And I think that that is what he seeks to do. And, and that is what we have uh, done here at XPO. And, and I view the spin process, both the prior spin of GXO, to which you alluded, and also the pending spin of brokerage as a part of the natural progression on that path. Matt, real quickly, give us an update on the sale of the European operations and also the North American intermodal operation. I understand that that still is uh, undergoing a bit of a review, but uh, it's it's moving along and percolating along. Well, I'm happy to indicate that intermodal the intermodal transaction is done. Uh, we sold that business in uh, March, so that is done, and we have uh, deployed uh, cash on the balance sheet uh, to pay down debt. Uh, so, so uh, we've already uh, begun to delever the balance sheet as a result of that. Uh, and then uh, as it relates to Europe, we have a process that's underway. It's a robust process. Uh, we're seeking to uh, sell that business. If we don't sell it, uh, we'll take it public. But but a sale of that business is plan A. Matt Fassler joining us on the Newsmaker line. He's the chief strategy officer at XPO. Matt, one quick question for you as I was reading your bio. How does a guy with a history degree from Yale end up in the trucking and logistics business? I've done a lot of things. And by the way, uh, I spent many years on, on Wall Street, and I, I focused on the retail and consumer industry. And with all due respect to the many merchants 
that I worked with. Uh, my favorite people to work with were, were the great logistics leaders uh, of some of these large companies that I covered. I covered Home Depot and Walmart and Lowe's and, and Costco and Target and got to know the people running logistics at, at all of them. And uh, uh, I, I still read history, uh, but, but I'm, I'm a trucking logistics guy now uh, w w with a dose of finance on the side. And, and, and uh, the, clearly, I'm, I'm no radio star. So <laughs> Now you do pretty well, actually. Matt Fassler joining us on the Newsmaker Line. This is Transport Topics Radio on Sirius XM Channel 146.